Well, greetings and welcome to Lessons for Living from the Letter of James with Reverend Dr. Absent Joseph. This is from his book, The Letter of James, an eight-week Bible study. Excellent book. I just finished that myself. Highly recommended. Uh, Dr. Joseph is with us today as part of the Wesley Seminary webinar series in collaboration with Indiana Wesleyan University with the goal of resourcing the local church. If you're thinking about seminary, you just have questions, you'd like to talk to somebody, you feel the Lord working on your heart and you feel like maybe it's time, give us a call, 877-673-0009 or send us an email at wesley at endwes, I-N-D-W-E-S dot E-D-U and we'd love to chat with you and answer those questions that you might have. Now, if you have any questions today during today's presentation uh, with Dr. Joseph, please enter those at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A forum, and Dr. Joseph will answer as many of those as time allows today. So again with us, my dear friend, Reverend Dr. Absent Joseph. He serves as the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Wesley Seminary at Indiana Wesleyan University. He holds a diploma in theology from Caribbean Wesleyan College, Jamaica, a Master of Divinity from Asbury Theological Seminary, and a PhD in New Testament interpretation from the London School of Theology. Before joining Wesley Seminary, Dr. Joseph served as academic dean at Caribbean Wesleyan College from 2005 to 2011, and professor of New Testament at the School of Theology and Ministry at Indiana Wesleyan University from 2011 to 2017. He is an ordained minister of the Wesleyan Church of Haiti. Dr. Joseph is passionate about international theological education, he served on the executive committee and chaired the Theological Commission of the Caribbean Evangelical Theological Association from 2009 to 2021, and he is a member of the accrediting commission of that association. Dr. Joseph is married to Reverend Dr. Larissa Levicheva. They have two daughters, Daniela and Sophie. Uh, Dr. Joseph is an author, and he is a prolific uh, expert at judo and a golf aficionado as well. So it is my pleasure to welcome my dear friend, Reverend Dr. Absin Joseph. Absin, thank you so much for joining us today, my friend. Thank you, thank you, Joel. Thank you for the invitation and I appreciate uh, I appreciate the introduction. You surprised me there with the judo. That was supposed to stay between <laughs> you and me, but thank you for the shout out. My pleasure. Yeah, welcome, welcome one and all. Thank you for uh, joining us today as we uh, look at lessons for leaving uh, from the book of James. Um, for the time that we have together, there's a lot we can cover, but what I've decided to do is to talk to you about uh, things that I have done in uh, the book that I recently uh, published with, uh, with Seedbed, which is an eight-week uh, Bible study uh, on the book of James, and uh, highlighting the key lessons uh, that I believe that James uh, is uh, was trying to teach to teach the church uh, the church then and uh, and these are lessons that I believe are still relevant uh, for us today and uh, my my hope is that as you um, as you participate with us in this in this webinar you will leave the time with, with a renewed desire and thirst uh, to not only uh, go back and read the book of James, the letter of James, but that your posture towards it, um, towards doing what it says, will also uh, will also uh, be 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 shaped by that. Um, James uh, is very practical. James is very pragmatic, and there's a way in which the key lesson in James is about the hearing the hearer of the word being predisposed to do what the word says. So if there's a book that one should not just read, but put into practice, it's the letter of James because his, his, primary, his primary purpose is to encourage his audience to be doers, uh, doers of the word. So when thinking about the letter of James, what are, what are the lessons uh, that we want to cover today? Uh, I'll talk about eight of them. The first is James. I believe that James is calling the Christians to a life of perseverance. Uh, the second is that he's calling them to a life of hospitality. The third is that they're calling them to a life of righteousness. 
He's also calling them forth to a life of wisdom, uh, a life of humility, uh, fifth or six, a life of dependence on God, uh, seven, a life of patient endurance, and then uh, a life of prayer. I'll spend some time fleshing out uh, each of these just to think about the ways in which I believe James is doing that. And then we can talk about, uh, I'll, I'll be curious to hear what questions you have. We can discuss these and, and then we can, we can talk some more. The first is a, a life of perseverance. And um, before we go into why will James want the Christians to persevere, uh, the first we can talk about is the fact that James is writing uh, to an audience whom the way he the way he pictures the audience is an audience who's in diaspora. And by diaspora, James is calling into the people's mind, the people that he is writing to, the reality of Israel when Israel was in exile. So exile, diaspora, um, James is using that more, most likely as a metaphor. However, the people that he is writing to, there's possibility that this, for these people, diaspora existence, being in diaspora was not necessarily a metaphor because truly these are Christians who might have been displaced. So again, when thinking about the life of the life of Israel, when the when the children of Israel went into exile, it was very difficult for them because exile tend to challenge um, their identity. When you look at the stories of people like Esther, when you look at the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being in exile challenges your ability to continue to be faithful to God. Being in exile challenges your identity to continue to live in a way that pleases God. Uh, and there's a way in which there are pressures that, that, that um, you go under as, as a child of God because what it means to be a member of God's family and what it means to be um, how it mean, what it means to live within larger society, often those two things, those two things clash. So when James uses the term diaspora to, to talk about his audience, he's pulling this image to the forefront because while, again, while some of these people might really have been displaced physically and geographically, he's addressing a larger theological reality in that Christians are in diaspora because they live as children of God in a society that, that's not friendly to, to you know, the ways of God, that's not friendly to the way in which God wants us to live. Um, so from that standpoint, diaspora then becomes a theological reality it's no it's no surprise that James will talk like that because again you see it already even during while Jesus Christ was on earth um, we see for example in gospel of John when Jesus Christ is really in his prayer for the disciples um, encapsulating that reality in terms of asking God well do not take them from the world but protect them from the evil one you see that tension between between what what Jesus is calling his disciples to do you are in the world but you should not be of the world so that tension that Jesus Christ is already addressing in praying for his disciple disciples is that tension that the church is living into and that James is writing to help them figure out how to how to do uh, how to do that life James is not the only one who's who's doing something similar, the general epistles as a whole uh, fit within that larger, larger framework. Peter does the same, but today the conversation is about, is about James. So then James is talking to them about how to persevere. And James opens up, so if you look at James 1, uh, 1 to 18, he opens up with, with teaching them how to face trials uh, in in diaspora, uh, how to face trials, and and for James, he 
talks to the Christians in a way that often the trials we face, they're both internal, they arise from within, because while you are living in the world, you see things that you desire and should not. You are envious about things that you should not. The reality of life as a Christian um, sometimes creates situations that, are, that, that brings about temptation. So for James, trials are both internal in terms of the things that we desire, the things that we seek, and also the external in terms of the things that we face. And James is encouraging the Christians or teaching them ways that they should um, manage those two expectations, ways that they should manage the desires that are coming from within or from without. And the, the, the letter is, is helping, helping the Christians get in the right frame of mind that allows them then to uh, to persevere in the in the face of in the face of trial one way he does that is to is to give them um, a, a picture of who god is a picture of who god is and he portrays god as what i call a generous giver um, he talks about god as one who gives generously but he's also about talk about god as as not just a good giver, but all, a, as a generous giver, but also as a good giver. God not only gives generously, but everything that he gives is good. And everything that is good comes from him. Now that's important because if we're thinking about trials, the, the, the people at the time when thinking about who God is, if God is omnipotent, if God is omniscient, God meaning God can do everything, God knows everything. And if we are his children, which means we are under his control, his tutelage, his protection, then if bad things happen, then we have to figure out the source of that. Does it mean that bad things have happened to me you know, comes from God. James is challenging that to say, well, the trials that happen, they are from within, and he talks to them about how they come. But then put the parallel piece of that is that God is good. If we know that God is good, then it helps us process the things that we encounter. Now, the situation that we may find ourselves in, the situation may not change, but if we begin to ask questions about those situations from a starting point that believes in the goodness of God, then it helps us ask the right kinds of questions. It helps us find the, the magnanimity to wait on God. It helps us find what it takes to wait on him, even if the answer we get is not the kind that we were looking for, or even if we don't get any answer at all. Because again, life in diaspora presupposes challenges. Now, it doesn't mean that life in diaspora is always bad, or that life in diaspora has to be bad. It means that life in diaspora is one where is one where we face challenges of all kinds but that we experience a god who is good a god who is generous and the way he offers his goodness is by coming alongside us to provide for us in the midst of difficulties by coming alongside us and give us his presence in a way that allows us to to experience uh goodness in a way that allows us to experience protection in a way that allows us to experience uh, provision. And um, James, for example, talks about God leveling the playing field. He, he treats everyone the same way. He is, he is a God who loves everyone, but he's not just giving a picture of who God is. He's also then portraying a picture of who we are supposed to be so because by by picturing who god is he is automatically also talking to the christians about who they should be because by portraying god as father 
those who are his children need to embody his nature. They need to embody his characteristics. So the, pre the, the picture of who God is also kind of uh, is connected to the picture of who or whom we should, we should be and whom we should become. Um, understanding who God is will then allow us to endure temptation. Again, if trials come from within, if we have a God who is good, a God who is leveling the playing field to allow us to do well in diaspora, then understanding these things will allow us then to endure temptation because those temptations are temptations that pull us away from God, the good father, the generous father, if we resist the urge to desire things that we should not, understanding who God is will allow us to depend on him, will allow us to, to, uh, to live in, in, in obedience, which are things that he will, uh, he will uh, talk about late, later on. A life of perseverance, perseverance in diaspora, because again, the, the God we serve is a good, generous God who gives us what we need who provides for us, who protects us, uh, and, and, and uh, help us endure temptation. The other piece that, the other lesson that we see in James also is, is a call to a life of hospitality. Hospitality is very important because often um, temptations and trials, because they are from within, comes because we are self-centered, right? So hospitality becomes important because hospitality allows us to turn towards the other. Uh, the, the word that um, in the original language that translates uh, hospitality is the love of the stranger. Um, and in 2023, we should not take for granted that James is asking his audience to love the stranger because um, when we think about both the history of the Jewish people and also in the ancient world, everything is done to keep the stranger at bay because what is unknown is dangerous. Um, but this is precisely how God wanted the children of Israel to live a life of difference. How to be different in society is to actually open your door to those you don't know is to be hospitable. And God in, in, um, in the Old Testament, um, in the Hebrew scriptures, told the children of Israel why he wants them to be hospitable. Why do they need to take care of the stranger? Why do they need to uh, open their homes and, and be hospitable? Is because they themselves were at one time slaves in Egypt. They themselves were also strangers in a strange land. And you see kind of the pattern throughout with, you know, Abraham left and was in a strange land. Jacob left, was in a strange land. Uh, Joseph left and went to Egypt. And, and you see the pattern. Um, Ruth left, you know, her country come, comes to Israel because the reverse had happened because Naomi and, and her family went down, um, went down to Moab and, and, Live in a strange land. There's a way in which even Jesus Christ in the incarnation, you've got God Himself, who is incarnate, who incarnates, takes on flesh, comes and lives among us. That too is, you know, is is a form of is a form of estrangement in terms of he left what was home, comes and and dwells uh, dwells among us, which means that hospitality is one of the core ideal of what it means to be uh to be uh, a child of god and in the context of life in diaspora hospitality allows us then to look beyond our own challenges look beyond our own limitations in order to then welcome uh welcome welcome the welcome the stranger um james will 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 set up the idea of hospitality within also the context of hearing and doing in the sense that the part where he discusses hospitality is the part where he is talking about the importance of not just 
hearing the word, but doing it. The proof is in the doing. And doing for James is going to be that, that key concept because our life, our actions are going to be the, the, the evidence of what we have internally, what we say we have. Who we are is expressed through our actions. And hospitality is one of those key, one of those key things. He will talk about our true worship being, being tested by our hospitality. Um, he talks about don't just don't just see somebody in need and tell them, oh, go and have your feel. But if you have the means to attend to that, then you should do that. He also addresses in terms of how they should they should do life together in terms of their ability as christians to to help and help those help those in need true worship before god is to care for the orphan and the widow again he's he's reaching back to the hebrew scriptures to take what god has told the children of israel and then teaching his audience about the importance of 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 these of these things if you think of um, Elijah and the and 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 the widow, uh, and the widow who is in need, and also you see both you know, in terms of Elijah, Elijah and Shunem, and uh, and um, the the with Elisha as well. Widows who did did not have a means in a way, but who actually leave who actually use the little that they have to care for, for the prophet of God. And we find that again, even the context of the children of Israel, God is asking them to do the same. Uh, Abraham is an example of hospitality. Now he had the means, but you see him being hospitable to a stranger who they did not, he did not know who these people were when he reached out to them. The same thing with Lot, being hospitable to the strangers uh, who were, uh, what he was at the gates uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that being a hospitable while in diaspora is a way to find a blessing because it turns our minds away from the limitations that we have. But it also is a sense of, living with open hands because we recognize that what we have is not ours what we have belonged to god if we if if what we have belongs to god was given to us by god then by offering it to another we are both acknowledging that it's god but we also acknowledging our own dependence on god and also acknowledging the goodness of God who is generous to give us more and give us back. Now, you don't do it because God is going to give. You do it because he is asking of that. But the action itself also demonstrates, uh, demonstrates that, that reality and that dependence on God. Uh, a, a life of hospitality, which, which which is done across the board without favoritism, okay? Uh, in that section, James also talks about the dangers of favoritism. And favoritism in this context is when you treat somebody based on what they look like. Um, when thinking about God as impartial, the, the, the language there is he doesn't take face. So favoritism is the opposite of that. When you first check out who the person is, what they look like, who their family line is, and whether they can repay you back, and you decide to do something. But James is like, ah, let's not show favoritism, because God is an impartial God, then again, connected to the fact that we need to add, embody God's nature. If God is impartial, God doesn't show favoritism, we also need to not show favoritism, and, and treat one another, um, both in fairness, but more importantly, treat one another with love. Um, he also talks about the royal law of love. Again, going all the way back, both to 
uh, the Decalogue. You shall love the Lord your love the Lord your love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and strength. And then also in the context of loving the neighbor as self, the the Decalogue. Also, you also have Jesus Christ in Matthew talking about what that looks like. So James reaching out to these teachings and bringing them uh, to the forefront for his audience to teach them about the importance of love. If we love one another, then we will, we will be hospitable, but not just love those who love us, love the strangers and what that looks like, how we go about it. Um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a key teaching. So life of perseverance, life of hospitality. He also talks about a life of righteousness. Um, and this is where James began to talk about the importance of, of a life of faith. And there he talks about faith as faith that is active. And what I mean by an active faith is the idea that you can't just claim to have faith. It, you cannot pay lip service to saying you have faith. You need to allow your actions to demonstrate that. Now, James' conversation about faith is squarely connected to his conversation about hospitality. Because what we find is he goes on and provides the example of Abraham in terms of his act of faith, which was, again, hospitality. And then he goes on and talks about the life of Rahab, whose act of faith is, again, hospitality. Okay, so he's now talking about what it means to be part of the family of God by being hospitable and he's using hospitality as the example of what it means to have true faith and again this is important because in the context of diaspora self-centeredness is what brings about temptation self-centeredness is what brings pride because if you are prideful you self-dependent not only do you not need your neighbor, but you also don't need God. Self-centeredness is that which allows us to have chaos. When he talks about a turbulent way of thinking, a turbulent way of life that creates the, the, the one who's, you know, the posture where you're not doing what you, you're not doing the word that you hear. So hospitality, faith, is a way to actually be a good doer of the word because you are putting in practice that which you are hearing, which is, which is again, both what God is telling, telling uh, the Christians um, from the Hebrew scriptures, which by the way, in the context of James, those who will have received this letter, right? Those who received this letter for them, the Bible, if we'll call it, will have been the Hebrew scriptures. And then also, the teachings of Jesus Christ, which will have begun to already uh, be circulated, which James himself is drawing from as he uh, as he writes as he writes that letter. Abraham's faith, Rahab's faith, becomes the 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 example of what it means to not just talk about faith, um, but to actually do something. Which is when he will now talk about works. So in the context of James, again, I've talked about active faith because the debate of faith versus work in James, I think, is, is mislabeled. Faith, J J James is not just talking about faith versus work, which one should happen. James is talking about active faith, the works of faith. What you do is an outflow of what you believe, what you claim to believe who you whose you claim to be if you are gods then you're gonna live a certain way that's the works those are active faith not putting faith and work in opposition but talking about the way our faith should have a natural overflow in terms of the kinds of life that we live and 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 what we do so then james challenges them to have a lived out faith or what i'll call a lived out faithfulness because our work the things that we do is an ex are an expression of our expressions of our faith to god which is expressed in good works which also is uh is faithfulness 
uh, to him for who he is to us, for what he does for us, and for the things that he gives us. James goes on then, if you are to have a life of righteousness, if you are to have, live a life of hospitality, then it's important to have wisdom, not any wisdom, the wisdom that comes from above. Just like he talks about, he, he talks a lot in terms of dual, uh, duality, um, true faith, bad faith, or claim faith, true faith, but also wisdom earthly wisdom, godly wisdom. He wants them to have godly wisdom. And this is where um, he focuses on the power of the tongue, okay? The power of the tongue and the dangers of uncontrolled speech. We need to be careful what we say, not just, not just careful in terms of what kind of things we say, but careful to make sure that what we say matches what we do. Careful so that we follow through on what we, on what we say. We cannot just talk anyway. Um, uncontrolled speech also, also is impacted in the context of, again, I need to go back to who God is, right? Because what we say and how we treat one another, he will talk about, you, you, can't, you cannot just talk any way about God's children, right? So he talks about the fact that uh, a source cannot give good water and bad water at the same time. So you cannot say you are a child of God, but you're speaking ill of his children that are his creation. Now, even there, James uses a language, not just of, of, God's children in terms of those who are in the family of God who are Christians, he is careful to use the language to, to imply that just the way you talk about people as a whole. So the hospitality again is there so that you're not just careful towards those who are in your circle, but you precisely are careful those who are outside of your circle in terms of how you talk. And in, in, a, in in 2023, it's very easy to hide behind with social media. It's so easy to hide behind a screen and then just launch attacks here and there. But James is asking us to be very careful about how we use speech because our what we say is a designation of what comes from within. And again, it connects earlier to the to the earlier context about temptation and trials that come from within, the desire and the urge to just say anything or to, to say whatever and to, to talk uh, in, in, in ways that are, not, that are not godly, that do not, that are not consistent with godly wisdom. So then James will demonstrate to, his, to, the, to the church, what is earthly wisdom? What is godly wisdom? And connecting these things both to show what you should not do and what you should do. And that's another piece of, that's another aspect of James's teaching that's very helpful. He doesn't just talk about what you should not do, but he also talk about what should be and gives the Christians a perfect image of what it means uh, to live uh, as, as, God's, as God's children. Consistency in speech wisdom, but also uh, a life of humility, a life of humility. Um, humility in a way that shows, that, that's demonstrated in the way we live with one another. Um, he will talk about controlling selfish desires, um, but also humility in a way we interact with God. Um, he talks about God as a jealous friend, meaning we need to be very careful as Christians not to, not to um, have two loves, in a sense. We need to be single-minded. So the single-mindedness that he talks about in the letter also connects here in that we need to have a, a single desire which is to serve God, a single desire, which is to please him. If, if we are double-minded in terms of our love for God and our love for the world, 
then that's going to be problematic. God is jealous, is a jealous friend, but he's not just a jealous friend. He also is a giver of grace, right? He doesn't, God does not, um, how do I put it? He, 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 he doesn't share his glory. He wants his people to be loyal. He wants his children to be obedient. But he offers grace. This is connected to humility. How? Because it is only through humility that we recognize our limitation and that we can put ourselves under the tutelage of God. It is only through humility that we refrain from taking care of ourselves, taking care of our needs, and acknowledge our dependence on God, which will be kind of the next lesson. It is only through humility that we, we can reach repentance. It is humility that drives us to understand that only God is the one who is in charge. So we need to refrain from the desire to judge one another. We need to refrain from the urge to pass judgment on others. And again, James is addressing this, but you can also hear um, Paul talking to the Corinthians. You can also hear him addressing the church. Um, I mean, you can hear Jesus Christ also telling his, you know, don't be judged so that you not be judged. Like the idea of humility helps us understand our place, our role within the economy of who God is, what he's doing, so that our relationship with him, our relationship with one another is guided um, by, by humility. But again, all of that's connected because humility is also, a display of humility is a sign of godly wisdom. A display of humility is a sign of righteousness. A display of humility is a form of hospitality. Okay, so then you find that often people talk about James as if James just strings ideas together here and there. Just, but but when you look, when you step back, the teachings that he's giving the church they are connected, and all of them driving towards shaping a posture, shaping a life whose single mindedness is driven towards pleasing God so that you can live in a way that also is hospitable to those, uh, those around us. A life of humility, but also a life of dependence on God. He, 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 he talks about dependence on God by addressing the uncertainty of life. Uh, you can't say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to do this, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Like, you, you can't make those statements. Uh, I'm from Haiti, as perhaps most, most of you know. And... Um, in Haiti, whenever we say something, we always finish it by, si bon Dieu vle, if God wills. And while this is in James, in Haiti, it's just embedded. It's just baked into the culture. Uh, understanding that we do not know what tomorrow is going to bring. None of us. Often we say it, but it, it's, been, it's been refreshing to, be, to grow up in a culture that don't just say it, but it's baked into our posture towards life. If God wills, you'll do this. If God wills, you'll do that. The uncertainty of life then allows us to understand that everything we do, everything we are, everything we aspire to be has to be submitted to the to the idea that it will happen only if God provides for it. It will happen only within his guidance. That is fine if we also believe that God is good, that God is generous. Again, that's the connection. If you serve a God who is good, if you believe that God is good, everything good you have can con only come from him. Everything he's, he gives you can only be good things. Then you can trust this God. Then you can submit yourself uh, to him because he's also the giver of life from within that dependence on god james again talks about the sins of omission which is connected earlier to true religion to to know the right thing to do and to not do it is sinful there's no oh, there's no neutrality and i'm not 
going into application in any of these on purpose because there are as many life situations as there are people who are watching this webinar this webinar meaning you the challenge for you is as you read james what is god telling you what is the sphere of influence that you operate in where you've got the power and authority to do something to improve the lives of conditions or any of of another person and you choose not to do it james thinks lack of dependence on god drives this and again because i, I talked earlier about living living open hand it, it, you do this because you're not sure if i give now will i have more for tomorrow uh, i i talked about the 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 widow earlier but it's kind of this similar process uh, in the context of obedience, right? Learning to learning to live like this, learning to depend on God, um, like thinking about the children of Israel in the wilderness with manna. It's kind of a different different example, but that drives towards the dependence on God. Um, today, God says to take enough for tomorrow. Tomorrow, He's gonna give. It's obedience, it's dependence. The next time he says, get enough for the weekend. It's about obedience. You can't say, well, yesterday you told me just get enough for one day. Why will you tell me get enough for two days? In both cases, it's obedience tied to dependence on God. Can you trust him and do what he's asking you to do? Can you live with open with your hands wide open because you believe in his ability to continue to pull more into uh into you because because he's a generous god because he's a good god and because he is god and he provides for us the last two the last two lessons uh, that we can talk about is a call of patient endurance which again perseverance is kind of the ability to to you know continue continue through to 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 continue to bear and endurance is the same idea but also in the in the sense that um endurance has a, a hope that is attached to it um you don't just bear for the sake of bearing you bear you patiently endure because there's a hope that something is going to change god will break in that's why he talks about the lesson from the farmers like they wait for the rain that that idea of waiting for the rain um you wait patiently because you know the rain is going to come you plant because you know the rain is going to come you don't have control over whether it comes or not but you don't also wait until it comes to to do the planting then it would be too late that's why he talks about the lesson from the farmers like look at the farmers who looks for rain um he he also talks about the you know the prophets he, he also talks about he uses job as an example for for patient endurance in terms of going through a problem and bearing through it because we know that God is going to come through uh, in the context of james it's important and you see peter does something similar in that James is writing to people who have the story of what God has done for his children throughout the Hebrew scriptures. And as you look at the acts of God throughout the Hebrew scripture, you see that he's a faithful God who never fails to show up for his children. So you can patiently endure because you know, we know that we know that we know that he will show up. When he does, how he does, you, we're not in control over that he also may choose not to show up but that's that's his prerogative will endure anyway um and within that context of patient endurance he comes back to talk about integrity in speech making sure that your yes is a yes your no is a no still connected to the single-mindedness still connected to the control speech because for james a life of righteousness is lived out through the way we speak. The things that we say, the things that we don't say, the things that we choose not to say, all of that's connected because 
it's it's a it's a, it's a way of life that's that's uh, that's lived out in in this context. He ends he ends the letter by by calling the Christians to a life of prayer. Um, and um, he talks about um, a time to suffer and a time to be joyful. Like he, when, when you read in, in chapter 5, 13, 20, you, you see that kind of um, duality. And then he, he gives a picture of a praying community. If one of you is sick, how do you go about that? You know, bring the community to pray for one another. And then he goes on and talk about the prayer of the prayer of uh, the righteous, the prayer of the faith will heal the sick, the power of prayer. And then talking about uh, Elijah as an example of one who prays for rain, not to come and it came, it didn't come and he prayed for rain to come and it came. Using him as an example again to talk about prayer. But again, the life of prayer is also a sign of dependence on God because if you pray to God, you are in praying to God, acknowledging your dependence on him. It's connected to the life of patient endurance, because as you pray, you're also experiencing and portraying the hope that he will answer, the hope that he will come through. And again, the Hebrew scriptures provide examples of people who pray and God hears and coming to and breaking in and doing uh, doing something. Prayer is so powerful that prayer has the power to change life, transform those who have left the fold and to come to come in uh, to come in to God. So it's a it's a big picture. It's a big picture that I trust both identify key lessons that James has in the letter, but also shows the connection of how these, these lessons all contribute to what I, as I mentioned before, to shaping a posture and shaping a desire to live for God uh, and in the midst of a society that, 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 is, that is hostile, in the midst of a society that, that doesn't believe in God or that does not um, treat kindly, take kindly to people who, uh, who trust in God. A life of perseverance, a life of hospitality, a life of righteousness, a life of wisdom, a life of humility, a life of dependence on God, a call to patient endurance, and a call to a life of prayer. That's all, folks. That's wonderful, Absent. That makes me want to go back and do this again. I So many insights, so many notes I'm writing down here. Uh, I had a text. Actually, somebody just texted me well, right after you started and said, how can I order the book? And I went ahead and put the, um, the link in the chat for anyone who would like to order that. And then when I send this out as well to those who registered, I'll include that link. And I'll, I'll post it on our uh, Facebook page as well. So anyone that uh, would like to read that. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, do have a few questions that have come in. If you have a few minutes to hang in here with us. And uh, for, those, for those of you who are watching live now, if you would like to go ahead and submit your questions at the bottom in the Q&A forum, uh, send those to me. And we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so here left. Uh, we'll try to get as many answered as we can. Uh, first question I got was, why did you choose the book of James to write about? <laughs> I think you've told oh, us that already, but yeah. Yeah, um, I, chose, I chose James because I've, I've, I write about places where I'm doing life and, and just it was it was a, a a way of saying what have my what what have i been learning how can i put it in a way that i can share with the world but very selfishly how can i share it with my daughters i have two daughters and i'm like okay what what is something that i can do that can teach them about how to do life in this world hmm. and it started it started there and um and then, um, you know, Seedbed reached out. They, they had, you know, they they also had a need. So their need also met what God was doing in my life, and um, and and I thought, why not? So that's 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 a simple answer to to why James. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the way that the book is laid out. Um, 
you mentioned the eight different areas and you have it separated into eight different weeks, but then you have a, we have scripture for each day mm -hmm. of the week. So there's five uh, days um, of scripture. And then we have a key observation, understanding the word. So an in-depth yeah. uh, look at it. And then I love you had, give us two questions. And at the end of that, mm -hmm. and then, so we have five days in a week of scriptures and reflections and whatnot. And then you give us a day to, to reflect and yeah. to go over that contemplate and contemplation. And, and uh, then you give us uh, and you give us these uh, questions, gathering questions, discussion outline to, to use mm -hmm. it in the Bible study as such. And uh, just great questions there. And yeah. So this, the I cannot take credit for the format because it was, this is kind of, again, Seedbed has the series in terms of the one day, uh, one book daily weekly so that's kind of the the format and it lends itself well to bible study sunday school so my wife and i uh, we teach the seven and eight grade sunday school uh, at our local church and we've been journeying with the students through that mm. uh in terms of so that's that's very that's very conducive to that to that kind of uh approach awesome awesome all right we've got a couple let's see i've got a comment here thank you this was manna from heaven that's from Sharon. Oh, thank you. Uh, Drex has got a question for us. He says, how can we apply James with the acrimony we're encountering in society today? I'd like to hear more about the acrimony, uh, what's meant by that. Um, but in the context of James, I, that's why I believe James is relevant today. James, James asks the reader, not so much to apply, but to become. Hmm. So the question, the question when thinking about the letter of James, it, the Bible as a whole, okay? But when thinking about James, it's less about how do we apply the word of James? It's how, how, do, we, how do we embody what James is teaching? How do we become the kind of person James is calling us to be? Hmm. Yeah. And, and I'll go back to what he says it's the reader who looks, at, when you look at the Bible, when, when you read the Bible, the way James talks about it is the picture of a mirror that reveals to us our true selves. And within that revelation, challenging us to be different. Mm -hmm. So again, while I don't know the details of what you mean by the acrimony, I'll say at least James is calling us to be the kind of person that through our hospitality, through our righteousness, mm -hmm. through the way we live in the world, people see us as God's children and, and, and live differently. Mm -hmm. um, and that to the extent that in James, he is challenging people in terms of the life from within mm -hmm. there's a challenge then to be the kind of person that is single-minded that have your focus on god the kind of person that is single-minded in that your word and your actions match that is single-minded in that you live in such a way that the outside pressures of the world and the internal pressures from within you're able to overcome them hmm. because you're dependent on, on God because you're praying consistently and because you are um, you you have what it takes to endure um, so from James the onus is less on the world as it is on us the challenge is on us uh, to be different Drex just put that as a follow-up he said thanks it begins with my transformation yeah Precisely. Yeah. All right. Okay. I've got another question here. Uh, Dr. Joseph can ask, what is your next writing project? <laughs> or maybe three, current. No, I'm you, struggling you're probably, with. <laughs> you're probably writing two or three or four at the same time. Um, I have three that I'm struggling with. I need to find the time. Uh, I'm working on a, a book that's based on Mark, hearing and doing the word of God. And uh, uh, you see, they are, they are just, Mark is reading the law from the margins, reading the law from the margins, looking at um, Jesus's posture 
the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees and putting that in the way they, they, they approach the law. And I'm arguing that Jesus Christ is reading the law positively and encouraging people to read it positively. Um, that's, that's a book that I'm writing with IVP. I have a book that I'm working with for Baker that actually is based on James and that's on hearing and doing the word of God. So what I've talked about, some of the things that I talk about here, I flesh those out uh, in a way that that kind of is kind of a way of a hermeneutics, a way of interpreting the text of also of interpreting life. Mm. How do you read the word and not just read it? How do you approach the Bible with a posture that understand its authority to challenge and transform your life? Mm to be the kind of person God wants you to be. That's hearing and doing the word of God. And I just accepted a project with Baker, uh, with Zondervan that is on a commentary on Second Peter and Jude in the, in the story of God Bible commentary series. So those are the three big projects that should keep it, be keeping me up, but <laughs> coming to a place near you. <laughs> Well, let, let me ask you one of my questions, if you don't don't mind. Sure. What would you say to someone who's watching live or maybe they're watching the recording and they're thinking about attending Wesley Seminary? What what advice would you give them? Uh, I'll say after? don't don't linger on that. Don't think twice about it. Wesley Seminary, uh, the way God is calling you to be equipped and serve, he has called us to come alongside you to equip you to serve. And we have a great great team uh, from the time of admissions to the time of graduation and beyond. We have a great team of people who are here to make you feel, not just feel, but to experience a sense of belonging that, that, that's, that's, that you want to experience anywhere, anywhere else. Um, I tell students, we do our best to treat you the way we want you to treat your congregations. Mm. your congregation in that with care with with love and keeping you accountable um because we want you to be faithful to the call that god has uh, given to you so if god is putting it on your heart to study and you want to come to wesley don't hesitate think um if you're watching the webinar after the fact the phone number was given earlier in terms of um where you can reach us uh just send an email, pick up the phone, uh, send a text. Uh, we're here to serve you. That's 877-673-0009. So thank you. And, and thank you. You touched on, I had a question to ask you about social media and you beat me to that with uh, um, how, how, or why do you think highlighting the power of the tongue is so important from page 39? Um, don't ask what me. Why do I think what? In, in the book on page 39, one of the questions you ask in reflection is, why do you think highlighting the power of the tongue is so important? Mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask you if you felt like that applied to social media as well. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, you already. Oh, yeah. Like social yeah. media is out of out of hand because people, because you're not face to face, you like that, that you, you hide behind the veil. Yeah. And um, if we take James seriously, our social media interactions will look differently. Amen. should look differently. Amen. Yeah, you're right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joseph Absin. I can't thank you enough for your time today and for sharing and for this. My week. pleasure. Again, the uh, link is in the chat and I will attach that uh, to the post and the emails as well. Oh, looks like we have. Oh, thank you for the presentation. David Ned yeah. says thank you. Yes. Got and if, if you allow me to say, like, again, the book is available if you if it's a Bible study or Sunday school, if you buy in bulk, uh, there's discounts available. And if as a church you choose to use that, I'm more than available. Uh, I can join uh, join you all virtually for a q and I'll come on site if you want me to um, so that we can join in with you and, and, and do that. And not just me. Uh, I know we're doing this for this book, but I want to also say our faculty is available to you to serve you and to answer needs that your church or churches have. Um, this is the way Western Seminary can serve the church. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's awesome. That's incredible.
So thank you uh, to the, those of you who are watching today. Thank you to Wesley Seminary and Indiana Wesleyan University for sponsoring this. Thank you to Dr. Joseph. Again, that number, 877-673-0009. If you have any questions, love to chat with you. Uh, and remember, we are Wesley, and you belong. You belong here. That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.